continuing with exercise number two. So we are at the stage where I made a custom emoji on that website that's linked, and then I saved basically just a, a nice size screen grab of it. Clean up my desktop a little bit. And now I'm going to open up my folder. Just bring it to the desktop. You'll find yours in Documents. And find my Exercise 2 folder. And this was the screenshot I was using. Now this is a pixel-based screenshot, because whenever you do a screenshot, even if it's of a vector, because this emoji on the website was a vector, but there's no way to screen grab a vector. When you screen grab, you're capturing the pixels of the screen. So that shows you how a vector gets converted into a raster image, for instance. And whenever it gets converted, it gets converted into some form of resolution. And because a screen is a standard of 72 pixels per inch, your screen grab will always be 72 pixels per inch. And the largest I could get it on the screen was 7.9 inches by basically 7.9 inches. What's interesting is when I outputted from the website just downloaded a PNG, which is a, a raster file, it gave me a lower resolution than the screen grab. And this is how we know it's a vector. So this gave me something that was four and a half inches by four and a half inches at screen resolution. Because a vector as a file can be expressed in any resolution. That's why we call it scalable. And that's the big advantage of it. But we're going to use this low, low res screen grab, and we are going to open it with Photoshop. And you can do it with PhotoP2. You can just drag it right into your, your browser with PhotoP. When I open it, the first thing I need to do is to improve the size and resolution. So what I did is I go up to Image, Image Size, and now I'm going to resample, so this is checked, and I'm going to change the number of pixels. I'm going to have the computer make up a lot of pixels because I want this to be at least 8 by 10, which means I should probably make it 10 inches by whatever. Right? And then the resolution, I want to be at least 300. That's always our minimum for these projects. 8 by 10 inches, 300 pixels per inch. But because Photoshop's very powerful, it's a little bit stronger than Photo P, right? I can use my preferred lab resolution, which is 350. It just gives us a little bit more options when printing. So Mine's going to be larger than 8 by 10 at 350 pixels per inch. And the reason I'm, I'm kind of forced to do that is because I don't want either of the measurements to be smaller than 8 by 10. Right? So if I made this 8, for instance, it would be too small. If I made this one 8, it would still be too small. So that's why I'm going to go right to 10. Here's the other thing that's interesting about the image size options. This is a really powerful tool because it gives you full control of every pixel. And you can force it to be what you want, but you can see what it does to the pixels when you do that. Because <laughs> growing pixels is not a good thing for quality. It's just what we do for our sketches. What I'm going to do is uncheck this chain link. And that's going to break the width from the height just so I can make it a clean square optional, but when I go 10 by 10, that was kind of crazy what it did for a second, right? If I did 10 by 1, it would squish everything into a 1 inch, but if I do 10 by 10, it's just going to stretch it a fraction higher. And then I say okay, and then look what happens, right? If I'm viewing it at the actual pixels, which you can always do by going view 100%, or command 1 is the shortcut for that, you can see how what were really clean vector shapes are now these really jagged, simultaneously contrasted, which is, means that you have brighter pixels on one side, darker pixels on the other side to help emphasize that edge because it uses algorithms to grow the pixels that uh, enhance that contrast. And so it just doesn't look very good. And you'll see this kind of stuff used professionally all the time when people upscale work force it to be more pixels than it was when they shouldn't, right? 
So this is the big reason for being able to make graphics with vectors so that they are scalable and never lose quality. The next step is to build on top of this. And you want to start with basic shapes. So whenever I say basic shapes, that means you want to start with the largest, simplest forms and build generally to the specific. So you start with basic shapes. You don't start right in with detail. So I'm not going to start building the eyeball right away, even though it's kind of tempting, right? Instead, I'm going to find the biggest general shape I can, and that's going to be a circle. So where are these shape tools? These are the vectors within Photoshop. They are three up from the bottom, and you click on that drawer and will open up all the shape options, which we'll explore. We're not going to use line tool at all because line tool doesn't give you a vector to fill. It just gives you a, a single path. But I'm going to start with the ellipse tool. And then I'm just going to drag and drop. Notice I haven't made a new layer. And if I want it to be a perfect circle, I can hold down shift, just like when we were cropping to a square in preview. And it doesn't need to be exact. I can make it about there. And then once it's once I let go, it makes the image. I can use my arrow keys. I can use my move tool to place it because it automatically makes its own layer. It makes its own layer with this little vector square in the corner. So that tag means it's a, a vector layer or a shape object layer, which means I can't do things like erase it without rasterizing it. And I don't want to rasterize anything in this project because rasterizing would mean it's locking the pixels at a certain resolution, which keeps it from being scalable. So the only requirement for this exercise is that you make your emoji entirely with vector shapes. That at the end of the day, when we're done with this project, I'm going to turn off this background layer and whatever I have made of only shape layers will be my project. And that way I could save it as any size I want and it will always be perfectly clean. The size of a building, the size of a planet, you know, and it will always be perfectly clean. The size of a postage stamp. Okay, problem is that circle doesn't look anything like <laughs> my, my guy, right? So if I want to change it into that yellow, what can I do? If you double click on the shape layers preview image, it will take you directly to a color picker. So it's a double left click in this window and you can get a color picker. And I can just pick a generic kind of yellow to begin with. Again, you don't need to match your sketch exactly. But whenever you see the color picker in Photoshop, it also means that if you click off of the color picker, it turns to what's called the eyedrop tool. And the eyedrop tool will steal any color that's open in Photoshop. So if I had, if I move this ellipse a little bit so that I could see the yellow of the face, then all I have to do is double click here and then click on that yellow and it will match it exactly. It looks like it has a tiny little outline around it, right? Because it does. That outline is not real. That's showing you that it's a vector. Vectors are paths. That's showing you the path edge. As soon as I click on a different layer, hmm. oh, never mind. That is real. <laughs> But even if I didn't have the stroke turned on, I'll tell you how to turn it off. So this is important. I don't want to have those outlines on my shapes, right? At least not right now. So you'll see this in what's called appearance, and that shows under properties. And when you click on your shape layer, you'll see that it shows up. Every vector will have a fill, and it will have a stroke. You want the stroke to be empty. So to do that, you click on it, and then you click on what looks like a red slash, like the no smoking sign, right? That red slash means no color, and that will get rid of that outline. But check this out. When I select it, maybe they've changed it in 2024, sometimes it will still have a little residual outline to let you know it's a vector shape, but when you click on another layer, that will go away. So... If you get that outline temporarily, don't worry about it. But if it stays there when you're clicking on other layers, check its properties, make sure the stroke is turned off. Now that I've made one vector shape, it's going to keep those appearance defaults for the next shape I make. So 
Let's say I want to make this big triangle. I'm going to go to the triangle tool. Make sense? Then I'm going to drag and drop, stretch it out, get kind of a big triangle. And notice it has the exact same fill and lack of stroke. And all I have to do to change that is I can click on the fill and then choose a color. That's kind of a long way to do it. Or I can just double click on that preview window and then click on the color I want it to match. Okay, now I need to rotate it, right? So whenever you make a vector shape, it comes in immediately with a transform box, just like when you composited and brought things in. With that transform box, you want to go back to the move tool at the top, and then you can move it around. And if you need to get that transform box back, we had a lot of practice with this. We're going to continue to practice it. You're going to hit Command T, and that's going to give you the transform box again. If you ever forget that, it's under Edit and Free Transform, and it will teach you the shortcut right there. It's Command T in Photoshop. It's, it's Option Command T in Photo P. So Command T, that allows me to rotate it. It allows me to squish it if I hold down Shift, right? But triangles can be picky. So you can hit Command Z. If you want to squish it, I mean, this is going to be unique problems for each of us, right? If you want to squish something symmetrically, like I want this hat to be a little bit flatter symmetrically, I'm going to hit Command T while it's on a horizontal, like so. And then when I hold down Shift, it will squish it equally on both sides. And then I can rotate it and kind of place it. But notice that my triangle is different than that hat. The hat is kind of a rounded shape. So how can I get that from my triangle shape? What do you think? So what's the difference between that shape and this shape, right? So this is my favorite of the transforms. Command T, right click, I can warp it. Warp it can change straights to curves. And so the first thing I'm going to do is drag down on this edge. And I'll get to kind of make it a little wonky and curvy. Can even bow it out a little bit on the sides. Okay, now already from the very beginning, I have a bit of a, a working difficulty. It's hard for me to see what I'm trying to match. So this is what I recommend now. I'm going to turn off my vector shapes. And I'm going to make a duplicate of my bottom layer, my raster layer. I do that by hitting Command J. If you ever forget that, you just go up to Layer, and it says Duplicate, right? So we duplicate the layer, Command J. Command J also works to duplicate a selection. Then I'm going to move that layer all the way on top of my vector shapes. And then I can't see my vector shapes, right? So then I'm going to do what's called onion skin that layer. Onion skinning is when you take the transparency down, you turn it into tracing paper. That's because early tracing paper was called onion skin. Right? So we onion skin it to about 30%. So it's just a ghost. But that will show me all the edges floating above. And so that I don't accidentally keep selecting this onion skin layer, I'm going to click on the padlock. And that's going to mean I can't make changes to it, but it also means when I'm doing auto select layer, I could select my vector shapes and not always select the thing that's floating on top. It will ignore it. So that becomes very helpful. So now I take my, my triangle hat and then I can command T and refine it a little bit. We don't need perfect refinement for this, and we're not trying to match exactly. In fact, my uh, book is Fahrenheit, isn't it? No, it's Lighthouse in the Attic. Lighthouse, Lighthouse in the Attic. Yes, that's right. Um, so what I'm going to do is actually ignore that background and instead kind of create a house-like shape up here. 
So you can go rogue right away, but sometimes you do want to match what you have. 